My presentation is part of some no, new work I'm doing, or a new project I'm sort of trying to uh, think up or, or launch. Uh, the, my, my main work is in uh, Japanese studies. Uh, the new project is uh, looking at not just the digital in terms of its technological effects, but trying to think about what's happening around the digital uh, as it's being sort of put forward as either a threat or potential over the last uh, couple decades. And so looking not just at what its technological effects are, but also what its sort of cultural effects are as other forms of uh, sort of cultural practice uh, and ideology are shifting around it. So my talk today is looking less at digital methodologies and looking at more really sort of issues of access. Uh, and these are issues of access to a lot of people uh, working in Japanese uh, media uh, media studies and, and related studies, digital media, uh, are coming up against sort of legal frameworks uh, that have popped up in the last couple decades. Uh, so I'm going to consider those and sort of ideological frameworks that are, are popping up to support them. So. <clears throat> As the Electronic Frontier Foundation notes, the 2011 Anti-Counterfeiting Trade Agreement, or ACTA, would, quote, create new global intellectual property enforcement standards that go beyond current international law and hand over increased authority to enforcement agencies to seize any goods that are related to infringement activities, criminalize circumvention of digital security technologies, and address piracy on digital networks. While ACTA received stiff domestic opposition in the US and Europe, the reaction in Japan was somewhat mixed. Although the government's support for the treaty met uh, with outcry in some quarters, Japan's lawmakers quickly ratified it in 2012 and sought to assure a skeptical public that the treaty would not significantly chain existing, change existing legal frameworks as they applied to the, quote, appropriate use of digital and network media. Subsequent uh, legislative moves have belied such assurances. In 2012 and 2016, the Japanese national diet passed major revisions to existing copyright law, aligning it with provisions in ACTA and later the Trans-Pacific Partnership. In addition to facilitating the criminal prosecution of copyright violations, even in the absence of a complaint by copyright holders, the revisions criminalized the use of devices and software systems that circumvent copyright controls. These developments suggest that, as many have warned, international frameworks seeking to regulate intellectual property, such as ACTA and TPP, do in fact stand to have significant effects on individual users' use of media. They also highlight a parallel issue that I would like to consider in part today through my talk. The digital rights management or DRM systems that the copyright revision sought to shore up uh, are precisely the type of technological fix that Tarleton Gillespie has argued present, quote, significant implications for both the production and circulation of culture, for the digital uh, networks upon which that culture will move, and for the practices and institutions that will accommodate decisions made in the courts and in the marketplace. Gillespie's remarks rightly emphasize the far-reaching effects of digital standards and infrastructure, reaching as they do into media and forms of culture outside of the strictly digital. Notably, although Japan's copyright revisions respond to a perceived problem of the digital, the ease and fidelity of copying that, dig that digital technologies are understood to provide, they are not just technological fixes, but also legal ones. Furthermore, they stand to have consequences for cultural production beyond new media platforms. To illustrate this point, I'll examine one example of digital technologies, uh, digitals, the digital's technological and non-technological effects on an older medium within Japan that of broadcast television. The digitization of broadcast television in Japan in the early 2000s arguably spelled the final demise of mid 20th century discourses on broadcast media's publicness, or kokyosei, an ideological formation that emphasized not only in, uh, its open access, but its imagined transparency predicated on its power to illuminate. As we'll sketch in brief today, these notions of media's transparency and thus its publicness have been absorbed within newer discourses on digital media and technology's opacity, whereby tra transparency has been repurposed as code for sanctioned access. While perhaps, not most the, while perhaps not the most intuitive place to start, television and its transition to digital broadcast in Japan offer a productive site to examine the broader effects of digital culture. Here it is important to recognize that while media histories may overlap in certain ways across national and regional boundaries, they also diverge. In contrast to the US, 
terrestrial broadcast in Japan alongside broadcast satellite or BS remains a vital component of the media landscape where alternatives such as cable television historically failed to reach the market saturation that they achieved in the U.S. from the 1980s onward. Furthermore, despite challenges from new media, terrestrial broadcast still enjoys wide use. Japanese television's digitization throws into relief the blended nature of the digital's impact. What, with the transition to, to digital broadcast, how television was understood and mapped within a broader range of cultural practices also shifted. For the rollout of digital broadcast during the 2000s, a consortium of equipment manufacturers and broadcasters adopted BCAS, or BS Conditional Access Systems, now standard on all ja television sold in Jap Japan. Christian Sandvig has noted how the internet, once imagined as the anti-television, has, with the growing dominance of video streaming, been technologically transformed and retrofitted to make video distribution possible, and the process become something more similar to the predecessor it was meant to replace. The story of digital broadcast and BCAS's adoption provides the inverse of this narrative in which broadcast television has, uh, was refitted in Japan to meet the needs of content producers and providers in a digital networked era. One of the very same DRM controls whose circumvention to 2012 and 2016 copyright law uh, revisions criminalized, BCAS reshaped Japanese television by abridging the broad of broadcast and recasting television in the image, if not actual shape, of a point-to-point -point service in which content providers and rights holders can regulate access to and redistribution of content. Managing the flow of data from point to point and device to device, the BCAS system manifests a shift to what Deleuze identified as one to post-disciplinarian control societies. BCAS, alongside similar strategies, modulates the movement of content data, controlling its decryption, transcription, and re-encryption. To view broadcast content, the viewer must insert into their television or receiver the BCAS card, which decodes the encrypted broadcast signal. Containing an ID number and master key in its integrated circuit, the card allows for the reception and storage of encryption keys with which the receiver decodes the broadcast signal. The card system serves two purposes. First, it allows for the creation of a paywall for certain content in which the card's ID number is used to regulate access. Second, it allows producers and broadcasters to curtail the redistribution of broadcast content. A viewer may record broadcasts on a BCAS compliant device, but they must insert the BCAS card originally used to make the recording, uh, recording before playback. They may also only make 10 copies of the original recording, a limit also regulated by the BCAS system. You can see down here it's in Japanese, but it gives you sort of an idea uh, of how BCAS is supposed to work uh, quite simply. Uh, although largely unremarked upon during the rollout of digital broadcasts, the transition to an access rights-based system inverted the notion of publicness originally attached to broadcast in Japan. That is the understanding, common to many early television markets, that the airways represented a public resource to be leased to private broadcasters who would operate them in the public interest. In Japan, the question of television's publicness was particularly critical in informing early debates on the development and direction of the medium. Notably, discussions of television's publicness channeled Enlightenment ideals introduced to Japan in the 19th century and resurgent during the post-war period, which imagined the properly managed public sphere as a space of clarity and illumination. As applies to broadcast media and debates regarding their publicness, these ideals were configured as what one might characterize as an opposition between the transparent and the opaque. Television's promise and potential as a public medium was to edify and enlighten, yet the rise of commercial broadcasters, as their critics would have it, threatened to cloud the foundational mission with vulgar and lowbrow content meant only to entertain. The decline of publicness as ideal had, of course, begun long before the 2000s, particularly with the solidification of commercial broadcasters' dominance in the, two, in the 1960s and 70s. However, television in general had continued to be an open access medium, particularly due to the continued strength of terrestrial broadcast. Digitization and BCAS, a system that was notably devised to protect in the interests of content producers rather than viewers, circumscribed the television's uh, openness and brought the media into line uh, with the IP regime that Japan's entertainment industries have come to pursue more broadly. That regime and strategy, as the caption to this image attests, is one of walling in intellectual property, controlling its flow across multiple media platforms, the so-called media mix, of which television is now just one component. 
in order to maximize profits while also stemming both copyright violations and disagreements. Uh, and these, so these are two images of two different uh, IP properties. This is a, a located around a card game system, but you can see if you you can see the TV up there. You see how TV is just sort of one component now, and the idea is, is that they're walling this in uh, to create sort of maximal flow. Yet while this walling in of media is accompanying a wider decline in ideals of media's publicness and open access, the transparency opacity binary that undergirded it has proven resilient, although transformed. Perhaps this is due to popular perceptions in Japan and elsewhere of an underlying opacity inhabiting contemporary media and their technological infrastructure. Indeed, numerous commentators have highlighted a foundational opacity, a black box effect within digital paradigms. Alexander Galloway, for example, has char characterized opacity as constitutive, con constitutive of contemporary societies, writing that, quote, a specific kind of blackness has begun to per permeate cybernetic societies, and further, this blackness is not simply an effect of cybernetic societies, but is in fact a necessary precondition for them. Yet while this constitutive status of opacity is critical, what I would like to focus on here is how perceptions of modern media's opacity has afforded a realignment of the transparency previously associated with publicness in mid 20th century discourse. Within the logic of the well-bounded constellation of intellectual properties, transparency and open openness have become associated with notions of security and the maintenance of the integrity of content and franchise boundaries. Images on the BCAS Corporation website cautioning against tampering illustrate this shift. Although somewhat laughable, the cartoon-like drawings throw into relief the ideological role played by the aesthetics of transparency and its counterpoint opacity in discussions of digital content and access. On the page, the corporation warns viewers against the use of doctored or so-called black cast cards that provide unfettered access to digital broadcasts, noting in print the illegality of their use while visually connecting an infectious opacity to their use. Advising viewers not to not attempt to produce, use, or sell hacked cards, the illustration re represents uh, these acts through a visual grammar more typical to that uh, used to depict computer viruses and malware. Featuring a black virus-like blob uh, floating out of a computer screen and being transferred to a television screen. In each frame, the potential criminal is depicted only in featureless silhouettes, suggesting a similar spread of opacity's contagion to the user. The images, the images highlight in visual and easily understandable terms how opacity has come to serve a twofold purpose within discourses on digital content and management of its flow. While opacity represents the prerogative of the operators of the black box systems, such as BCAS, those same operators deploy the threat of opacity as a cautionary tale to users who would undermine or exploit the black box system, framing the opacity of the black box as an infection that endangers the would-be violator. Transparency, on the other hand, transitions within this discursive framework. <clears throat> uh, within this uh, discursive framework, from a quality of media of their supposedly enlightening effects to a visual code for proper sanctioned use. Put in other words, transparency no longer encapsulates what media can do for us, but what we may do with the media. Ultimately, organizations such as the BCAS Corporation claim opacity as a right, which they exercise in order to maintain the systems and protocols that secure the bounded space of sanctioned access and use. While transparency represents a circumscribed set of practices permitted to the user. In her analysis of early internet discourses of the 1990s and 2000s, Wendy Chun highlights an inversion of freedom that tracks with that of transparency as I have traced it here. Chun notes a conflation of freedom and control in these discourses within which the control of networks unwieldiness is configured as a means of protecting one from a deleterious form of openness. Here, freedom becomes reimagined as a circumscribed space of safety which control secures from the dangers that lay beyond. Reflecting on these shifts, Chun proposes that we open ourselves to the possibility of, uh, impossibility of control, thus dissociating security from freedom and embracing the latter in its more unwieldy and radical form. In terms of the present discussion, unfettered open access to cultural objects and texts certainly carries appeal since it hews to older notions of transparency. However, it's not necessarily a cure-all. One need only recall the history of Western inquisitiveness and acquisitiveness that led to the physical appropriation of others' cultures in the name of study and preservation. More recent examples likewise point to the tensions created by demands for access and the ability of new media to provide it. 
in the wake of the 2011 Japanese earthquake and tsunami, for example. Western news organizations rushed to provide images of the human devastation caused by the disaster, including images of the victims, a move that upset Japanese sensibilities that perceived the images as disrespectful to the deceased and their survivors. This histories and these examples underscore that transparency and total open access is not always desirable in all cases. Nonetheless, the aim of frameworks like TP that seek to steer IP policy uh, is by all appearances not to protect against a repeat of historical wrongs. In fact, and as is often noted, the holders of IP rights are often entities other than authors and producers. Media mix strategies such as the one introduced above or previously often sideline authors and producers, minimizing their ability to profit from their own creative productions. A more appropriate strategy might be to rethink, at least in some circumstances, our allegiance to transparency. Here, Galloway's discussion of opacity of the black box is instructive. He proposes that we, quote, functionalize the black box by programming it. That is, accept a certain inevitability of opacity rather than automatically eschew it. In this spirit, we might reconsider opacity and its now inverted relationship with transparency, reimagining a publicness that incorporates opacity and not just transparency as one of its foundational principles, claiming it as a public right rather than one of private interest. Thank you very much. <laughs>